Our next speaker, we've had uh, Pastor Mike Spencer here before, and he's always uh, very passionate about what he says and always has a wonderful message to share with us. But for those who have not heard Mike before, he is married to his wife, Barb, uh, in 1984, and one year later they moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana in order to, for Mike to attend Fort Wayne Bible College, where he graduated in 1989. He served as pastor for 23 years up in... Uh, Fort Wayne oh, and now Ohio. Fort Wayne and Ohio, up, up north. Uh, but he's left the pastoral role to devote full-time energies to equipping pro-lifers to make a case for life. Mike now serves as the Midwest Director of Training for Life, uh, Training, for life Training Institute. He and his wife have four biological children and one whom they adopted from Guatemala, and they reside in Salina, Ohio. Mike? Well, it is a privilege to be with you today. I, um, it's good to see some children here. We raised our children um, outside of the abortion clinic in Fort Wayne, and I tell people that the inside of an abortion clinic is a terrible place for children, and the outside is a wonderful place for them. So I commend you, moms and dads, for having your little ones here on the uh, front lines. I was only five years old in 1967 when Bobby Gentry's song, Ode to Billy Joe, soared to the top of the charts and became an international hit selling millions of copies. My dad bought the single, or the 45, or for those of you under 30, that's a little record, they, it has music on it, it's kind of like a CD, and um, I play that song over and over again because I was captivated by its haunting melody and its very mysterious storyline. Some of you know the song. It is a song that is sung in first-person narrative. A teenage girl tells the story um, of her family at the dinner table helping Mama break the tragic news uh, that a neighboring teenage boy, Billy Joe McAllister, had jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge, presumably to his death. This shocking news is contrasted against the banality of mundane life and polite suppertime conversation. No one seems very moved by Billy Joe's death. The brother responds indifferently by asking for another piece of apple pie. And all Papa can say is, well, Billy Joe never had a lick of sense. Pass the biscuits, please. It is a deeply disturbing song, and although it no longer enjoys much airplay, this fictional family's response to the heartbreaking news of Billy Joe McAllister's untimely death reflects the attitude that many have today toward the plight of the unborn with respect to legalized abortion, which has now claimed the lives of about 54 million little boys and girls since 1973, and claims the lives of about 3,400 children every day in America. As pro-life apologist Greg Kokel has said, abortion is a yawner. Abortion is a yawner for most Americans. In most circles, circles, even among many professing Christians, raising the issue of abortion is considered impolite conversation. Jesus warned that in the final days the love of most would grow cold. This pass the biscuits please attitude in the face of legalized abortion suggests that we are there now. Legalized abortion tells a story. It reveals a great deal about the nation that sanctions it and about the church that tolerates it. How we respond to abortion reveals a great deal about us. It says something about what we really believe about the nature of the unborn and how narrowly or how broadly we draw our circle of moral responsibility. Now I think I know the answer to the question because you're here enduring, enduring, the, enduring the cold weather on a day like this when you could be at home watching a football game or something. But I'm going to ask the question anyway. What does your response to legalized abortion say about you? Many of you know the name Casper Ten Boom, the father of Corey Ten Boom. Casper was a Christian, a um, a uh, Dutch Christian who lived in Holland during Hitler's war on Jews. He was a watchmaker and uh, he believed the Nazi persecution of Jews was a great uh, affront to divine authority. And when the, the uh, Third Reich required Jews to wear the gold star on their armbands, Caspar Ten Boom, a Gentile, a Christian, 
willingly, voluntarily wore that gold star as well in order to identify with his Jewish friends and neighbors. Eventually, he and Corey, his daughters Corey and Betsy and son Willem, um, turned the ups one of the upstairs bedrooms of the home that they lived in, which had the watchmaker shop on the, on the, the uh, ground floor, they turned that room and they built a small uh, a hiding room, a hi hiding place there. Uh, some of you have read the book, The Hiding Place, or the seen the movie, The Hiding Place. And they hid Jews there. And uh, Casper and his family were eventually found out after many months of doing this. And they were hauled off to death camps. In fact, all of them died in those death camps with the exception of Corey. And Casper uh, was at the time, I think, 84 or 85 years old when he was arrested and taken to the Schwengen uh, 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 prison camp. After being uh, taken there, he was interrogated by some SS and they asked him, or they made him a deal. They said to him, Casper, old man, we will send you home today to die an old man in the comfort of your own bed if you'll tell us where the Jews are, because when they raided the house, they didn't find them. If you'll tell us where the Jews are, and if you promise not to have any more activity like this, we will send you home to die in your own bed. Do you think Casper Ten Boom took that deal? No. No way. You know what he said to them? If you let me go today, tomorrow I will open my home, my door, to anyone who knocks for help. Casper died ten days later as a result of his imprisonment. And as we consider our own Holocaust today, it's a word that gets bantered around a lot and perhaps has lost a little bit of its punch. But the reality is, is we are standing in front of an abortion clinic that takes the lives of little innocent boys and girls every day. In 1993, my wife and I held in our hands a little African-American baby girl that had been aborted and dumped in an abortion clinic dumpster outside of the abortion clinic in Detroit, Michigan, my hometown. A friend of mine lifted this little girl from the dumpster with the intent of giving her a proper burial and in the meantime was showing her the world. And my wife Barbara and I held that lifeless little body in our hands. She was seven months along. She had been aborted uh, through a saline solution abortion so her body was still intact although it was terribly discolored because of the, the uh, poison, the salt poison she had been um, killed with. And there's something about holding that lifeless body in your hand that makes all of the abortion choice rhetoric fall to the ground. All of the cliches and all of the sloganeering crumbles when you hold that lifeless little hand or lifeless little body in your hands. Um, we admire Casper Ten Boom and people like him because of his response to his Holocaust. And no one with a moral compass would dare suggest that Casper's actions were too extreme or too radical. What about us? What does our response to abortion say about our beliefs? We hear a lot today uh, about abortion from the other side. One of the things that we hear is that abortion is a complex issue. We're told this all the time, abortion is a complex issue. Actually, it is not. Now that's not to suggest that abortion is not a complex issue psychologically for the young woman who finds herself in an unwanted and unplanned pregnancy. Does she deserve our sympathy? Absolutely. Does she deserve our tangible help? Of course. But how does it follow that because abortion is psychologically complex for a young woman facing an unwanted pregnancy, that it is therefore morally complex? It really isn't. Greg Kokel, to quote him again, said this, If the unborn are not human, no justification for elective abortion is necessary. But if the unborn are human, no justification for elective abortion is adequate. The abortion choice crowd would have us believe that no one knows when life begins. They seem to love to shroud the issue in complexities and ambiguities and confusion. No one knows when life begins, we're told. Which is not an argument at all in favor of legalized abortion. It's an argument against it. Because if we don't know when life begins, we shouldn't be pulling the trigger. Amen. Yes. The reality is we do know when life begins. And I'm not quoting the Bible, although I could certainly do that this morning. But the science of embryology tells us that life begins at the moment of conception. And that's an indisputable fact. And I'm not going to spend time defending it here. I don't think I need to. But what about the question, what is it that makes humans valuable in the first place? 
What we're really asking when we ask that question is, who counts as one of us? Who counts as one of us? Something really sneaky and slippery has happened in modern times. If you look back to the years leading up to 1973 when Roe versus Wade and Doe v. Bolton made abortion on demand through all nine months of a pregnancy legal, the argument that the pro-choice crowd was using to defend legalized abortion was it's not a baby. It's not a human being. And they shrouded the unborn child, they masked the unborn child in euphemisms like a blob of tissue or a product of conception or a mass of unwanted cells. Some even referred to the unborn child created by God in the womb as a parasite. But something happened to the abortion industry. In the 80s, when this ultrasound technology uh, advanced so rapidly and so profoundly that we now had a window to the womb, the entire world was seeing that this was not merely a mass of unwanted cells, but a developing little boy or girl in utero. And then pro-lifers in the late 80s and in early, early 90s, uh, through the uh, movement of Operation Rescue, started lifting the little boys and girls out of the dumpsters behind abortion clinics, photographing them and showing them to the world. And people, got, people began to see what abortion does to an unborn child in all of its horror. And so the abortion industry had a problem on their hands. They knew they had to change the debate. And so here's what they did. Now instead of arguing it's not a baby or it's not a human, they conceded those points. And in fact, many prominent pro-choicers today, such as David Boonin and Peter Singer, are quick to acknowledge that yes, the unborn child is a human, is alive, is a little boy, is a little girl. Most pro-choice people don't deny that anymore today. What they have done is they have divorced humanness from personhood. And they've said, yeah, it's a human, yes, it's a little boy, yes, it's a little girl, but it's not a person. A little sleight of hand here, a little trickery. And they've done this, of course, so that they can continue to defend and support the slaughter of unborn boys and girls. Men and women, we know that there is no difference between a human being and a person. A human is a person, and a person is a human. Now, whenever this has happened historically, Whenever we have seen those two terms divorced from one another, humanist and personhood, somebody has been targeted, either the minority or the weak and the vulnerable. We saw it with the Jews in Nazi Germany, we saw it with blacks in our own land today, and now we see it with the unborn. We're told that they're not persons. Now if you talk to the average pro-choice person on the street and say, well, what is a person then? When is a human being a valuable, protectable uh, human being or person? They'll say things like, well, when they're sentient, when the child, when the unborn child is sentient or self-aware, or when the unborn child can feel pain, or when that little boy or girl can live outside of his or, mother's, uh, his or her mother's womb, viability. And they have all of these subjective, arbitrary measurements to determine the worth and the value of human persons. Now the problem is, is the pro-choice crowd can't even agree on these. One person says it's sentience, the next pro-choicer tells you it's viability. It can't be both. Either one determines the value of a person or the other one does, but one cancels out the other. And they can't even agree on this. You see, they are, they are completely dependent upon slogans, cliches, and sleight of hand trickery. We are not. As pro-lifers, we believe that every life is valuable. In the womb, out of the womb, black, white, rich, poor, Jew, Gentile. Every person is valuable. We don't grade the value of a human being based on their functional ability or their talent. You know, pro-lifers sometimes make the mistake of defending the pro-life position by borrowing from the pro-choice camp. Let me illustrate this. And we've got to be careful of this, that when we're defending the, the pro-life position, that we're using good arguments, not weak ones. People will say, we shouldn't be aborting because we might abort the next Einstein. Or we might abort the next Gershwin. That's all true, but that's not why abortion is wrong. Abortion is wrong because we might abort the next Down syndrome child. It's not that we might merely abort the next Einstein. Every life is valuable. Every life is precious. Abortion is the unjust... That's right. Amen. Amen. Abortion is the unjust killing of innocent human beings at their most vulnerable stage of development in the most barbaric manner imaginable. Abortion dismembers, decapitates, disembowels, or burns a child to death 
in his or her mother's womb without even the benefit of anesthesia. Abortion is an attack on children. Abortion is an attack on women. Abortion is an attack on the family. And abortion is an affront to divine authority. Amen. Mm -hmm. Say it. If we believe this, if we believe this, and I know that you do, then our response should look like Casper Ten Booms. We should be willing to serve, to suffer, and to sacrifice on behalf of the unborn and their mothers. You know, it's, easily, it's easy for us, comfortably removed by 50, 60 years of history, to look back to Nazi Germany and say, you know, had I lived back then, I would have hit Jews in my home just like Casper. You know, maybe you would have. But you know, the cost for having done so was huge. And his whole family was carted off to death camps. You know, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback this and to romanticize sacrifice when those who have paid such a dear price are dead, you know, centuries or at least decades old. I, I will be honest with you, I have wondered many times, if I had lived in Nazi Germany, if I was an adult in 1943, would I have taken that risk? Would I have hid Jews in my home? I would like to think that I would have, but the honest answer is, I don't know. Again, the cost for doing so was so high, exceedingly high. But here's what I do know. If I will not stand for the unborn in America when there is virtually no cost for doing so, then I can know with absolute certainty I would not have stood for my Jewish friends and neighbors in Nazi Germany in 1943. This is our great character test. Abortion is, legalized abortion is the test of the church in America. And how we respond to this is how we're going to be judged decades from now by our children and our grandchildren. Amen. This pass the biscuits please attitude in the face of legalized abortion must stop. And I want to end with a word of encouragement to you. And I'm not saying this because it's, you know, sort of expected of a guest speaker to say something kind and fluffy and flowery. I'm saying this because I believe this. I was pro-choice until 1984. I saw in 1984 a movie called The Silent Scream, and it showed an abortion actually being performed. And it sickened me. And I have been involved in the pro-life community for 28 years now. And I can honestly say that I have never seen what I have seen in the last couple of years. And that is an unbelievable revival of interest in the plight of the unborn and their mothers, not so much among my age bracket, but among the high school and college age students today. A lot of my work now with Life Training Institute is on university campuses and high school campuses. And I'm telling you what, there is a revival of interest. And just very quickly, in closing, uh, I graduated from Bishop Foley Catholic High School in 1980 in Detroit, Michigan. I went back there just a, a, a few weeks ago to uh, do a, speak to an assembly to the entire student body of, of my alma mater on the subject of abortion. When I sat in that school in 1978, 1979, those years, nobody was talking about abortion. Nobody was talking about abortion. I don't remember ever having a conversation with anybody about abortion in high school. Maybe I did, I don't remember it. Today, everybody's talking about it. When I walked into my alma mater, the first two students I saw when I walked in that day were two young girls with red tape over their mouths doing the silent solidarity, the pro-life uh, event. And that's right. Nancy Keenan, here's a word of encouragement. Nancy Keenan, the director of NARAL Pro-Choice America, the nation's leading number one pro-choice lobbying group, just resigned in recent months. And she did so citing what she refers to as an as a, um, intensity gap. She was basically conceding the point that the pro-lifers are building an army of passionate young men and women who care deeply about the unborn, but the pro-choice camp is not seeing that kind of intensity in their side. And she resigned, hallelujah. She said she was stepping aside for younger blood to come in and, and, and hopefully raise up a younger crop of people who will defend the, the uh, killing of unborn children. Let's pray that that doesn't happen. But, but you know what? That's evidence of the fact that our efforts are working. Don't give up the fight, men and women. We are going to see the day when Roe v. Wade is part of the ash heap of history. And uh, may it be so. God bless you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you.